Indeed, an intense story coming from Matthew 21. <clears throat> and in a way, these are very harsh words. You know, Jesus is essentially saying, here, let me flip to it and remind us kind of what Jesus, if you have, if, again, we, it's always useful to keep these uh, the uh, Bibles open for this. In Matthew chapter 21, in verse 43, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce fruit. He kind of trapped them, didn't he? He kind of said, he said, if there's all these people who are kind of stealing, you know, attacking all the people who are coming to uh, retake uh, the, the vineyard, what shall we do? And they say, well, of course they should be bound. And Jesus is essentially saying, that's you guys, the Pharisees. Not you, I'm not pointing to all you guys. It's, we're metaphorically seeing the Pharisees there. That's, so you can understand the Pharisees are, are coming at this like, whoa. And if we didn't know what was going on in the context of the story, we might ourselves go, wait a second, Jesus. You're the God of love. You're the God of mercy. What is with all this talk about, you know, beating and stoning and killing and then wretched end for those who do these things. Let us rewind the clock and remind us where we've come so far. We have been learning about this, um, this journey of Jesus with his disciples through the book of Matthew. And we've walked alongside Jesus' journey where he is coming and proclaiming that he is the king. He is the Messiah. He is the one who is to come. But of course, the group that seems to be always against him are this group called the Pharisees. Pharisees were, I mean, many of us might already know, Pharisees were, uh, were religious leaders at the time. They were the ones who, in theory, should have known and recognized, and yet all the way they're opposing Jesus. Let's go back in time a little bit before this passage and see where we've come so far. We've learned about all these stories so far this year. In Matthew chapter 9, verse uh, 10 to 11, this is one of the first times that the Pharisees and, and Jesus kind of come head to head. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, Matthew himself is a tax collector, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Many of us might already know that tax collectors at the time were seen as like the worst of the worst. People who had betrayed their own people to work with the oppressive Romans. People who were down and out, don't, don't look at them, don't talk with them. They are evil people, and yet Jesus is having dinner with tax collectors and sinners. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Already showing that these Pharisees are not okay with Jesus and the way that he is going about these. Don't, doesn't Jesus know that these are like the, the Cretans of society? And yet Jesus said he came so that these people might be the ones that, that come and are, and are healed. Fast forward again to Matthew 9, 34. But the Pharisee said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out the demons. They're essentially looking at all these miraculous acts that Jesus is doing and saying, he's doing it by the spirit of the dark forces. And so this would not, of course, get them all on Jesus' side. Moving forward to Matthew 12, 24. But the Pharisees heard this. They said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Again and again, the Pharisees are going after Jesus, not recognizing who he is, seeing all the signs of the kingdom that was to prophesied to come through the Messiah, and they are rejecting. Matthew 15, verse 1 to 2. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders. They don't wash their hands before they eat. And remember, we talked about legalism several weeks ago, where they were just looking at all the rules that Jesus wasn't following, not the important, uh, not the law, because Jesus was still keeping the law. He said that the law won't be broken, but there's all these extra rules on top of the law that were placed in order to help them not obey the law. But it was becoming for the Pharisees, more about the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. More about trying to keep people in this legalistic box than having, showing mercy on people. And then, of course, Matthew chapter 16, Jesus starts going on the counterattack. He starts saying to the crowd things like, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is just one verse. In the context of this passage, he's basically saying they're like, they're, they're like a disease that is multiplying. 
And the Pharisees understood exactly what they were saying and were very offended by saying because he's basically saying the Pharisees and the Sadducees have got it all wrong and if you sort of let them in, they will grow this, 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 this sickness of legalism and not recognizing the kingdom that's there is going to grow if you side with them. So it's like, oh, fighting apples, eh? Then in the immediate context of this passage, Jesus starts continually teaching about the kingdom. And we talked last week about one of those stories about the workers in the vineyards where the first are the last and the last are the first. So he basically, as we said last week, the people who are going to inherit the kingdom are going to be the ones who humble themselves and are not necessarily going to be the ones that have been there all along in the, in the vineyard of the kingdom. They are the ones that are going to recognize that the, you know, the treasure that is being given out by that vineyard keeper. Uh, and then immediately previous to this passage that we just read, so now we're getting a little bit more close to the actual sto- parable we read, Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Many of us know the story, the story of the triumphal entry where Jesus comes in on a horse, basically demonstrating that he is now coming in as a king to basically take over the kingdom of God. Many of them expected they were going to be coming, he was coming in as a sort of an earthly king where they were going to drive out the Romans and return to an earthly kingdom. Little did they know it was more of a spiritual kingdom. But yet he is clearly in front of everyone, including the Pharisees, calling himself out as this king figure. He goes on to teach about the kingdom through this story in Matthew 21, verse 22, where he curses a fig tree. Fig tree was sort of a symbol of, of Israel at the time. And by cursing this fig tree, he is in a way uh, saying that this, the old way of connecting to God is to be cursed. There's a new way brought through him, of course, that would not be accepted very well by the leaders of the old way, of their way at the time, and the Pharisees not too happy. Again, and then right immediately before this passage, he tells this parable of the two sons. And this is worth reading because it's especially important to help us understand why Jesus is telling this parable of the tenants that we just read. Jesus says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go forth, go and work today in the vineyard. Again, another vineyard analogy. I will not, he answered, but, the latter, but latter he cha- later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. So he's saying, go to the vineyard, go to the, but he says, I will not go. So he said, which, which of the two did what the father wanted? The first they answered, Jesus said, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did, and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So already, it's like, wait, tax collectors, sinners, they're going into this kingdom before the people who have been here sort of supposedly all the time? What is this? And then, of course, the parable of the tenants. This story where Jesus is kind of upping up that language, saying, actually, the kingdom is going to be transferred from the likes of the Pharisees and given to another group. Fighting words from Jesus. The kingdom is going to be transferred from one to another. We can understand, I think, a little bit of why... I think it's very easy to see the Pharisees as this kind of boogeyman, bad guy that is sort of like necessarily evil. But you can... I can kind of understand from their perspective. If I, in my state where I am preaching a a, a way of following uh, our Lord, which I do most weeks here, and we do it in a particular way, and someone was to come here and say, you know what... You're not recognizing the truth, and in fact, the thing that you've come to believe all this time, it's actually, you're you're kind of have it right, but you have it slightly wrong, and in fact, what's going to happen now is the inheritance of the kingdom, all this reward that you've been preaching is now going to be transferred from you to this other group. It's like, what is that other group? Oh, the group that are, are the exact kinds of people that you've been saying all this time are the people that will not inherit this kingdom. And I can understand from that perspective 
that that would be very hard to hear. So for all of us who are worried, are, are we on that side? Are we on the purple side or are we on the green side? Do we, how do we know that we are the ones that are inheriting the kingdom? Well, let's just look and notice about what Jesus was tell, has been telling us all this time. First of all, we have to recognize who we are. Anytime we think we are this higher moral caliber people, we better check ourselves. Jesus is saying right here in these two parables that the kingdom is going to be taken from these religious types and being given to the tax collectors and the sinners, the bottom of the barrel. The beginning of our journey with Jesus must begin with the fact that we are sinners, that we deserve nothing. For all the things that we do for our, uh, for, in our Christian work, life, in, for all the things that we do in our friendship circles or in our neighborhoods, if all we do in the political sphere, everything that we type on social media, none of this buys our way into some sort of promised future. The place we begin is we are all sinners. We count ourselves among the rest of humanity, we are not any better in this room, in this church, in all the churches than anybody else in this world. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. If we approach the kingdom from this standpoint of, you know what? I have this real, I'm, I'm pretty special. Or I've got holiness that's better than the other person. We better check ourselves and recognize we fall in line with all the worst and worst in society. Anytime we think there's a class of people out there that is less than, and which is one of the more concerning things about one of the things that are happening in our culture. This, I, there is something to be said for justice, but there is this turn I'm noticing in society where one of the ways in which we think justice is to be gained is by demonizing, or they say canceling, a whole group of people. And I'm not one to say that we shouldn't decry or, re or, or cry out for the poor and the oppressed. But we also have to recognize that we ourselves are the ones who have every right to be demonized, canceled, rejected, ostracized, for we too are not perfect. We too have something that if it was to be revealed and put on social media, that the world would be right to look against us. We start from that place where we recognize our fellow humanity amongst everyone and say we are all in need of a savior. So what did the Pharisees not do that we are to do that counts us as one of these folks that's inheriting? It's in our humility knowing that we are sinners is that when the king comes that we recognize Jesus, many, many times, even for all the compassion that he might have had for the fact that he might have looked a little different than what they rejected, he said to the religious leaders, you know the scriptures better than anyone. You should have seen all the signs better. Time and time again, Jesus would repeat back to religious leaders, leaders and say, look at all the signs from scripture. I am the fulfillment of this. In fact, look as I am bringing the kingdom of God through these acts. Look at these miraculous things. Can you not believe your own eyes when you see me coming into your neighborhood, healing all these people? All the rest of these other folks see it. All the people around you see and recognize these signs. And even the Romans, that Roman centurion in Romans chapter 8, who noticed, he, he had no business knowing well, who Jesus was, and yet he comes and he approaches Jesus and he says, I do not deserve for you to come under my roof, and yet you just simply say a word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, of course, what did he say? He said, I have not seen faith greater than all this in all of Israel. It's recognizing Jesus, recognizing who he is among us, knowing that we are no good, but he is the one who is good. And not simply rejecting or calling all of these miraculous things as something being done by other powers, that recognizing that all of the cosmos is under his lordship, and that in our life, as you yourself witness the signs of the Spirit, miraculous signs in your own life, that you call attention to that and point your gaze to Jesus, the one who originated all of those things. 
And then, fi- and, then, and then finally, simply, after recognizing who we are and seeing Jesus for who he is, submitting, falling on our knees and submitting our life to him. You know, it, it, those Pharisees were, were thinking, and in many ways, a lot of the Jews that still remain today, if, if you talk to them, especially the more Orthodox Jews, they still think a Messiah is coming. And many of them, and I'm not going to be the one to say I'm an expert in Jewish theology, but when you hear them talk, it, it sounds to me like they're waiting for um, a certain level of righteousness to come within the Jew- Jewish community to kind of have them be worthy of the Messiah coming. It's this whole, like, now I've got to work my way into the kingdom. And yet, the thing that Jesus is saying all along is that tax collectors and sinners are welcome among us. But they recognize me. And it's not that they immediately stop every single act. But what they do is they follow me. That is the invitation that Jesus gives throughout the scriptures. Follow me. Follow me. The disciples themselves were not fully ready disciples at the very beginning of the journey. We have seen through this very journey that Jesus says at the beginning in Matthew chapter 4, come follow me, but then at so many points during the way, they failed to recognize him. When the, sto- when the storm was, was storming around them in the boat, Jesus said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? They were not quite ready and fully there, and yet they were following him. And that is the invitation for every single one of us. If we find ourselves in a place where we might think We are on the wrong side of this divide. If by reading this story we feel like, you know what, I wonder if I am on the side that is going to have the kingdom taken away from me. All we need to do is recognize that we are a sinner. We confess. We say, Lord, I I am no good. I confess my sin to you. We we, 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 we recognize him for who he is. We see him in our lives and we believe. This is why we baptize people. It's because it is a sign for those who are just at the beginning of their journey where they say, you know, I have found Jesus, I saw Jesus, and I am recognizing who he is, and I declare that I desire to follow him. It's the beginning of the journey. If you haven't, if you recognize the truth of Jesus in this world, in your life, and you have not yet been baptized, we have some baptisms coming very soon. Perhaps you might get in on that. Please talk to me. But then, of course, beyond that, we respond to Jesus' call to follow. I've said many times before, we are not judged based on the perfection of our execution of our righteousness. There is always righteousness given to us. We are simply ones who desire to follow him and by our will make an effort to walk alongside him even while we will stumble. And we have shared many times of sort of the ways and way in which we're going to think about this in the future in Priory. It looks a little bit like this. The text is a little small, but there's these sort of seven circles that we are developing that gives us a gui- guidelines as to how we actually do that following of Jesus. Not that we do all these things perfectly, but these are the guiding posts that bring us along with a life of submission to Jesus. Rather than having a physical Jesus here today who says, come and follow me, and we literally follow him on the way, we now follow him by gathering with his people, by learning uh, from his word and from one another, by praying, by serving, by loving one another, by encouraging one another, and by giving what God has given us. The exact same things that Jesus taught his disciples to do on the day, and this is how we live it out. We will stumble. We will fail. But we will find ourselves, and we are, in fact, inheritors of the kingdom. Not because of anything we have done, but by just simply recognizing who we are. Recognizing Jesus. And walking the walk, however imperfectly, to follow Jesus along his way. For some of us, that might be an invitation for a recommitment. We might find ourselves in a state where we feel like we aren't quite there with Jesus. We confess We recognize and we commit to follow. In silence, I invite us to do all those three things together. Let us us pray.